Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from WisPolitics.com. Welcome to our virtual luncheon today. Uh, we have a assembly fall races preview with the two leaders in the assembly, GOP Speaker Robin Voss and Democratic Minority Leader Gordon Hintz. I want to thank our sponsors for backing and supporting this series of events throughout the year. I want to thank Hush Blackwell, American Family Insurance, Walmart, XL Energy, AARP Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin Hospital Association. Coming up, we have some events uh, that you may be interested. Next week, we have two events. On Tuesday, we have a panel discussing the legacy of Pat Lucy, who at this time in 1980 was running uh, uh, as a vice presidential candidate for uh, with independent John Anderson. Uh, and there's a new book out by Dennis Driesang on Pat Lucy, uh, a former governor. And then on Wednesday, we have a special event on the generational difference, exploring the generational differences among female voters in Wisconsin. And uh, you can find out uh, more about those events at the wispolitics.com website. And then on October 15th, we'll do the Senate version of today's discussion. So I want to welcome in right now, Speaker Voss and Minority Leader Hintz. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, good afternoon. So, uh, uh, Representative Hintz, uh, you are there, right? You yeah, said, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. I was just looking down for a second. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Great. So let's just start with the news of the day. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of the races and the political climate in Wisconsin. So the Big Ten football, uh, the Big Ten conference announced today, the Big Ten football is back starting in October 23, 24, I believe. I'm not sure about the details in terms of fans and all that, but given what's been going on on UW campuses uh, or on campuses nationwide, is this, a, uh, is this a good idea? Let's start with Assembly Speaker Voss, who was, was pushing for football to come back. Yeah, I think it's an example that the world's beginning to return to normal and do so safely. Uh, I think we got a half a win. Of course, I want to give credit to Barry Alvarez for really leading the effort across the Big Ten to find a way to be able to have uh, sports and especially starting with football played safely. So congratulations to him. Uh, we look forward to an exciting year, uh, hopefully more Badger victories. Um, I think that the idea of making sure that we can do it safely with rapid testing and the ability to isolate those, uh, you know, if any players or teams contract COVID, I think those are really good ideas. I'm a little disappointed that they decided not to allow fans to attend. Um, other sports have been able to do that where you can socially distance. You still have the ability to have fans in an empty stadium uh, in a limited degree. So that was disappointing. But obviously, as a Badger fan, I'm excited that we can watch them on television. Uh, and it's one more example that as the world learns to cope with the COVID virus, that we have to start to return to normal and do it as safely as we can. So congratulations to the UW. Exciting times and looking forward to a good season. There may be fans outside the stadium, though, even if they're not inside the stadium. We well, in Dane County, you never know. They'll probably have squad cars patrolling if you have any Badger gear on close to the stadium on game day. <laughs> okay. Uh, Minority Leader Hintz, uh, what about, uh, is this a good idea considering what's been going on on UW campuses? Uh, well, it raises questions, and I know we look at pro athletes, and I remind folks, despite the massive moneymaker that uh, Big Ten football and college athletics are, these are students, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, um, and it's important, as excited as they are to play, that we're making sure that we're protecting uh, them. And, and the timing is a little odd, given what we're seeing on campus at UW with the shutdown, um, but I also understand when the decision was originally made, uh, we couldn't answer questions on healthcare protocol and protective measures that could be put in place. As I understand it, I saw Chancellor uh, Blank put out um, you know, a statement that she was comfortable with those things being met. Um, I also was happy to see that the Big Ten was gonna be picking up uh, the testing costs, but um, boy, uh, I would just hope that if we do have the kind of spread that it's not hard to imagine happening, especially among the demographic that in their social lives has probably been the most difficult to get to adhere to practices, uh, that there would be some protocol to make sure that we are able to, um, you know, pause and uh, prevent something bigger from spreading. I know there's other colleges around the country that have had to delay games once they've started a season because um, of the impact on their players. But we'll cross our fingers. I know we all want something else to do and uh, supporting Badger football is something that we would all miss. and. Um, I guess we'll, we'll hope for the best, but I'm, I'm cautious. So, I mean, this brings us to what, what's hanging over everything this year is 
the uh, the pandemic and from the legislature meeting to uh, running races like you normally would, uh, you know, to uh, you know the atmosphere in the uh, uh, presidential race and beyond. So uh, let, let's just start with you, uh, Representative Hintz. How would you classify what the current political climate is is in the state right now? Well, I mean, uh, in terms of the electoral cycle, we think it's one of opportunity. And in terms of how that meshes with the pandemic right now, um, you know, the reality is I think the president has made such a mess of this. And I think there's really a lack of understanding, a lack of science-based, a lack of public health support um, from Republicans all the way down. And I think we've seen that at the state level. And I think when you look at polling on uh, how the coronavirus has been managed, uh, you see the public recognizing the work of Governor Evers and of Democrats and looking out for them at a time when they certainly want people to be doing those things. Uh, it's a balancing act. We know that schools are impacted right now, uh, but it's hard to discuss even issues that may have been big 18 months ago uh, without the context of what's happening right now as it relates to the pandemic and what's ultimately going to be happening um, going forward. Uh, I think you see uh, purely by some of the attack ads that have come out early here against some of our candidates and uh, incumbents that, you know, there's nothing about the COVID, there's nothing about uh, even some of the past issues. It's kind of the tired laundry list of socialism, um, you know, taxes, dog whistles, things that I, I don't think are um, really pertinent. It's more of a distraction and it's more doubling down on Donald Trump's brand, which is uh, something different than we heard, uh, at least during the 2016 presidential primary. Okay, well, I think there's a lot to, to answer there, Speaker Voss, but why don't you just start off by talking about what the current political climate is from your point of view. Well, unfortunately, we have probably never seen a more divisive climate where, you know, almost every single issue has delved into politics, right? I mean, even uh, professional sports, uh, whatever TV shows that are on, it seems like people can't help themselves but to try to inject, inject politics into every single part of our society. And I would think that's one area, and there aren't a lot, that Republicans and Democrats really agree on, is that we don't need politics 24-7, and we especially don't need people who spend all their time denigrating the other side. Um, so I'm proud of the record that we have. Wisconsin is in a really good place. If you look at where we were uh, before February 1st, we had a fantastic record of achievement. Uh, we had a budget that passed, really focusing on conservative principles that cut taxes while also spending more money on health care, ensuring that we have more money for schools, and all at a time that we could focus our priorities around the ones of the state. COVID came. Of course, that changed the world when we passed a bipartisan bill. I think there were only a couple Democrats that voted against it. That actually was a pretty comprehensive plan to help folks deal with COVID early on. Uh, we then saw that as other states around the country had massive budget deficits, Wisconsin really has a balanced budget all within about a percent or two. So we're really in good financial shape. We are focusing it with our economy now gradually reopening, thanks to Republicans. I think if it were up to the Democrats, we'd look an awful lot like Dane County, where most businesses uh, are not allowed to operate in a way that can help them be profitable. Uh, I know that if you're a hospitality person, especially in Dane County, you're struggling to even be able to survive in the long run. That's what the rest of Wisconsin would look like if Democrats controlled everything. So we were able to balance it out, uh, making sure our economy is reopening in a safe way, doing it in a way that ensures we can have an economy going forward and hopefully in a way that showcases the good things that we've been doing, as opposed to what my Democrat friends seem like, where it's all attack all the time. And I think people are just sick of that. So uh, the way this works, uh, people who are turning in, tuning into the, either via YouTube, our YouTube channel, or uh, via the webinar, I just wanna, you know, I ask questions of the, uh, the guests for the first part of the program, and then we go to audience questions. Some, some of you did uh, submit audience questions uh, when you registered, but there is a chat function uh, uh, on in the webinar, and you can type in your question now. We probably won't get to every question. That I'll have to pick and choose, but that that's coming up. All right, uh, gentlemen, let me go back. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the Speaker Voss on this one. You know, there's no real filter. Uh, yeah, there's congressional races, but there's no real filter in Wisconsin this year between the presidential race and all these legislative races. So it's sort of like everything is nationalized. To me, it seems that way. Is that, is that a good or bad thing for, you know, running your races? 
Depends on the part of the state. Um, you know, if you're in an urban area and you're a Democrat, you probably want it to be nationalized. If you're a Republican uh, and you're in a rural area, you probably want it to be nationalized. I had some of the seats that are a division of both where I think there are some challenges for each side. Uh, we know rural Democrats have a hard time standing next to Joe Biden. Some of our suburban seats, people have a more difficult time standing next to Donald Trump. I mean, that's just the challenge that we have right now. So I think it's why it's important that we in the legislature have always had the opportunity to have our own brand in addition to running with the top of the ticket. We know that in 2018, when Tammy Baldwin was running for uh, re-election to the U.S. Senate, uh, Assembly Republicans carried 15 districts that she also won in. So there are a lot of ticket splitters all around the state. Uh, we know that in 2010, uh, there were ticket splitters that chose Governor Walker and also uh, chose Democrats. So I think there are opportunities for us to really showcase what we are. We have a strong brand. I think we have a great record to tell. And that's why our candidates have been out there campaigning. Now, you're right. When you knock on a door, uh, people have really intense emotions right now. Um, if you are spitting mad about Donald Trump, you probably don't want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the good things that we have done. But there are enough people that we've been able to persuade that I feel really good about our incumbents opportunities to be reelected, even in some more challenging areas, because they've got their own personal brand, they're working really hard, and they have a great record to tell. Before I go to Representative Hintz, uh, Speaker Voss, when you talked about knocking on the door, I think the Republican candidates uh, seem to be, and groups seem to be doing that more than Democratic groups. And Representative Hintz, you'll get to talk about this too. But, you know, what a, what's your strategy there? Why is it safe for your folks to go to the doors? Sure. I love the fact that the Assembly Democrats have basically ceded the field to Republicans to say we want to be interacting with voters. As of, I think, sometime this week, we will hit over 160,000 doors. Uh, across the state with our candidates and our team talking to voters, listening to them. Uh, the things that I found as I go door to door, probably more than ever, uh, people want to have a conversation and they want to talk about issues. They've been home by themselves, only talking to perhaps their relatives or a few close friends. So they want to have that political conversation in a way that maybe not traditionally would be the case. So I feel very strongly that as we've gone across the state, I could say less than a dozen times has someone been offended that we knocked at their door because we do have masks on when appropriate. We do socially distance. You don't walk up right to the door and try to walk inside. You kind of step back and you're kind of off the porch or making sure you're socially distant. So we have, I think, a great ground game. Uh, the president does too. I know that they have more staff, more field offices than they ever have before. We are making more voter contacts now. I know my Democratic friends are basically telemarketers where they sit at home uh, auto dialing people all day long uh, from a strange number. I don't know about most people watching or listening, but if a strange number calls, I don't normally pick up. It goes to my voicemail. So given the choice between being a telemarketer as a Democrat or going door to door, interacting, asking people their opinions and listening to their thoughts, I'd rather choose the door to door method and we've been able to do it safely. Okay, Representative Hintz, the way this works, it's hard to, you know, uh, I kind of have to call on you, but you can answer some of the things that the speaker said and then talk about the nationalized climate and how that helps or hurts you. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the nationalized climate. Um, we th certainly think it helps us. Every 12 years, you have a cycle where uh, there's only one statewide race, neither U.S. senators up, uh, no constitutional offices, and the fact that you have a divisive president where we're seeing you know, traditional Republicans either voting for Joe Biden or having to make a decision on actually turning out. And even if there's a decline of 10% in that area, uh, that's certainly gonna benefit us in, in a number of seats. And <clears throat> the speaker's right that, that it, it probably varies. I think the president's gonna be popular in a lot of parts of the state and less popular in others. And uh, you know, so the nationalized part of things, it, it, it really depends. Um, you know, that being said, if you were to imagine, well, which presidential candidate would win if they won by five points in the state, I think that only can be Joe Biden. I, I do expect it to be closer, um, but I don't see Donald Trump winning by those kind of margins. And so when we look at what kind of opportunity or where we will be closer to voting, which, by the way, starts in a few days, um, you know, we will have to uh, see, uh, you know, what the impact is. But we're what we're seeing is the same kind of um, disdain for Donald Trump's politics is, is um, coming down to the local level. We have districts, especially in the suburbs, uh, that have changed dramatically. You know, it wasn't that turnout was different, which we see can explain shifting numbers cycle to cycle. It is people that voted, you know, in, in the 23rd Assembly District, Jim Ott's seat, uh, Tammy Baldwin got 33% in 2012, and she got 53% in 2018. 
uh, and over 65, 70% of the voters were the same. These aren't people who um, are turning out for one candidate or another. They're people that are changing their minds. And you've got a changing district, but you've got a state representative who hasn't changed at all. He's been one of the most extreme members. He voted against things like the smoking ban, voted to get rid of uh, the ban on racist mascots, uh, domestic partner benefits, you name it, um, and has been you know, lockstep with uh, you know, brand of politics that I think is out of touch with that area. So there are state issues that I think uh, mesh better that people understand uh, that it's not just a Donald Trump problem, it's a Republican Party problem on all the way down. Um, you know, COVID has a switching to the second part of it. Um, the coronavirus has certainly had an impact on campaigning from um, getting nomination papers to uh, going to different kind of group events of which there are fewer. Uh, we have candidates that are doing doors. We have candidates that are doing calls. Um, I can say that the voter contact effort has surpassed anything that I uh, have seen, um, really by renewed urgency by all you know partners, players, the party, ADCC, our candidates. Um, I've been doing sort of a hybrid where I do doors depending on the neighborhood and demographics and, and drop other times. Uh, certainly going to events where you can be outside and, and socially distance. And I think the speaker's right. I mean, if you have a mask on and you can keep distance and, you know, people don't have to answer the door even if they're home. I knock twice and then I go. I always remind people of that. It's okay. Um, you know, that, that kind of depends on up to what the individual candidate um, and their own risk and exposure uh, is. But we're confident that we're getting the kind of numbers and the enthusiasm that we see not just at the national level to um, you know, get rid of Donald Trump, but to get somebody in there like Joe Biden and uh, the opportunity that we see obviously to protect the governor's veto, but to make some headway heading into redistricting, I think has people fired up. For some, it's gonna be the national uh, you know, importance and for others, it's gonna be really about the next decade of Wisconsin politics. So we'll stay with Representative Henson and go to Speaker Voss. What are your candidates hearing, or what do you think should, should be the top issue? Are your candidates hearing, you know, Democrats uh, seem to be stressing health care and Republicans are stressing the economy. But is, is health care the number one issue uh, when you're doing voter contact? Well, I mean, health care, education, and the economy are always the big three. But I would say the lens and what has changed on these issues is sort of the debate uh, on the coronavirus. Uh, are we going to uh, make balanced decisions with the input of public health experts and with science? Or are we going to kind of do things like the president has done with a sort of incoherent, calling things a hoax, sending messages to the public that, they, you know, they can go out and about, that it's no big deal, it's just the flu? Um, or are we going to lead? I mean, the reality is the economy isn't going to be restored until we are able to contain, test, and reassure the public that, uh, they can go out safely. Uh, Wisconsin has been the second most open state in the country, uh, I believe, since Safer at Home has been, uh, was struck down by the courts. And it's not like the economy has been restored. I mean, the market will work when people ultimately feel safe. And the numbers that we're seeing in the upper Midwest and in parts of Wisconsin, I think are giving people pause. Obviously, with parents, it's not just about education. It is worried about um, the safety of their kids with teachers are, you know, how do we provide the resources heading into the next cycle to reassure parents that the money will be there for safety, for technology, for flexibility, given that we will probably be managing uh, in this environment, governing, making decisions in this environment with the coronavirus uh, for, for quite some time. I think managing our own expectations is key. So, you know, the economy tied to coronavirus, education, child safety, uh, tied to the coronavirus, healthcare, making sure that um, people have access to it, that they can get treated, that they can get the coverage, um, you know, a, a key part of things. So I would say the big three issues remain priorities for the public. Even in good times, we knew that, that there were a number of things we needed to be doing that we weren't doing. Um, you know, but the reality is there are stark differences on the approach and the importance and what needs to be done on the coronavirus. And I think the public recognizes that. So, so, Speaker Voss, uh, you know, you heard that uh, coronavirus is, the, you know, uh, and its influence on the top three. What's your view on what uh, your candidates are hearing at the doors or what is uh, the best strategy, the best issue strategy? Sure, it's really focused on two issues. Gordon's right about that. Coronavirus and the, how we deal with COVID and get our economy restarted is probably the number one issue, probably uh, twice as much as any other topic that people bring up. 
Uh, it's important for us to kind of look at it in segments. Uh, number one, we have a really good healthcare system in Wisconsin. We've been very fortunate that hospitalizations are relatively low compared to what we have seen and predicted by some of the early models. Uh, we know that we've been able to get our healthcare system back to semi-normal, uh, where more of the elective procedures that were delayed uh, over the course of the summer are back. We also know that in the last budget, we provided quite a bit of increased funding for hospitals, nursing homes, and that was very prescient because now they're being able to utilize those funds uh, to help deal with the increased cost of fighting the virus. Uh, in education, one of the things that really has been underreported, probably because the mainstream media seems to be so much in the, the tank for uh, Democrats, but one of the things that we did in the last budget, if you remember, is we proposed and Governor Walker signed a bill that allowed oh, us- Governor Evers. No, this was Governor Walker. Oh, okay. uh, Governor Walker, two budgets ago, okay. uh, we proposed something where every single child in high school was able to get a one-on-one -on -one device so they'd have access to technology. Oh, okay. We actually provided a matching grant for local school districts. We actually wanted to provide hotspots so that we would increase the ability of young people in school to have access to technology. Governor Evers, in the last budget, as we looked at to expand that program, he vetoed it out. So every single child in the state who does not have access to a laptop in high school is 100% because Governor Evers made a decision to veto that program in a really partisan way that made no sense. And now a year later, we realize how wrong that decision was as more and more kids have had to go out and figure out how do they access technology to be able to now learn inside the classroom when they're not able to go in in person. And then lastly, one of the things that Gordon forgot to mention because it's really, uh, I think a sore point and a weak point for their campaigns is the idea of making sure that public safety is first and foremost. They have candidates running for the assembly who are literally running on a platform to defund the police. That is not in the mainstream and it certainly is not something they wanna talk about because the vast majority of Wisconsinites support good men and women who are in law enforcement, who are protecting our communities and wanna make sure that they keep doing a good job. Now, if there are a few bad ones, we wanna make sure that we have an opportunity uh, to weed those folks out, but to paint with a broad brush like they have where Governor Evert's first reaction uh, to what happened in Kenosha was to put out a statement almost immediately, more or less blaming the officer before all the facts are known. And then it takes him four days to bother to show up, to even sit down and hear the people in Kenosha. Uh, that's not leadership. And that's where I think people are looking and seeing a huge contrast between uh, someone who kind of leads from behind, that's Governor Evers style, where he really doesn't take ownership or leadership on any topic, and someone who is really front and center trying to take charge like President Trump does. So Representative Hintz, Minority Leader Hintz, I think, uh, you know, uh, you might want to answer this, uh, the defunding police uh, element. Yeah, I'm, I, and I'm happy to. I mean, I think that's a boogeyman that's out there uh, being used or exploited uh, off an issue that is obviously far more complex. Um, and, you know, I'm someone who was the... Uh, you know, Professional Police Association Legislator of the Year. And so I know that uh, the defunding term isn't necessarily productive, but it's about restructuring things. I think we've had Republican and bipartisan support for doing a lot of the reform efforts. I uh, wish that we would meet on them uh, that would address some of the systemic issues that we see in terms of use of force disproportionately um, against people of color. And our candidates are certainly pushing that. I mean, it is possible to respect um, and recognize the work that is done by men and women in law enforcement and still want them to be held uh, to a high standard of accountability uh, and transparency. But uh, look, I expect these guys to do that. But um, remember when, uh, when we exempted uh, law enforcement from the coverage in the COVID bill, uh, they spoke out pretty, uh, you know, pretty strongly. So it seems like we only want to stand with men and women in service uh, when it is perhaps uh, politically opportunistic, uh, not necessarily when we could put things in there that would uh, protect them given their frontline service to the state. So um, we're not running from that discussion. We know that the public, again, I think agrees with Democrats that um, we support our men and women in law enforcement who are asking to do impossible jobs into areas far beyond public safety, uh, but wanting to make sure that we're holding a high standard for those that are in that field and that we're not seeing certain communities um, impacted differently in that work. Okay, let, let's go back now. We're gonna talk about the top races to watch. Now there are many races to watch. Of course, there's 99 seats in the assembly, but the number of swing seats uh, and targeted seats is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a fraction really of the 99 uh, seats. So uh, go to Speaker Voss, in terms of um, 
you know, the goal, the state of Republican goal is to have a veto-proof majority. How confident are you that you can get to a veto-proof majority, and what are your pickup seats? Well, first is um, the most important thing that you begin the cycle with is candidate recruiting and finding really good people that represent the districts that they are running in. Because uh, if you don't have a good candidate, it's hard to win any race, no matter how uh, you strategize to do so. So we have the most Republicans running. And in fact, there are 92 um, people running for the assembly as Republicans in the 99 seats. There are only 86 Democrats. Uh, so it's the first time uh, since 1986 that we have had this many candidates running. And I think that's part of the enthusiasm that folks have about wanting to serve in a legislature where things get done and you can do so in a way that really makes Wisconsin a better place. Uh, when I look at the races that we have, of course, we see some of the suburban seats that are uh, much more in uh, jeopardy than they have been in the past. Uh, if you look at seats like the 24th where Dan Canodal is, the 13th with Rob Hutton, or the 23rd with Jim Ott, none of the three of them even had an opponent in 2016. And now we see uh, that there are Democrats running. And when you have out-of-state billionaires pouring in literally million-dollar contributions, uh, don't forget that Governor Pritzker in Illinois hasn't done enough to make that state better. So he needs to pull Wisconsin down to their level so that Illinois residents and businesses won't flee to the Wisconsin like they have been. He gave a $2.5 million contribution to try to buy the legislature in Wisconsin. So uh, I hear all this money talk where Democrats decry the fact um, that money is in politics until it really benefits their own side, where millionaires from California and billionaires from Illinois want to bring their brand of socialist policies here to Wisconsin and try to get by the legislature. That's really what they're trying to do. So our candidates are working. Uh, they've been out there. I am very confident that we're going to come back definitely over 60 seats. Uh, I think we have a real chance with some of the candidates that we have running. We have four uh, of the best potential pickup opportunities. I think we're going to beat Robin Vining. We have an excellent candidate and one named Bonnie Lee. Uh, she has been working harder than almost any candidate that we have. In northwestern Wisconsin, James Bolin almost beat the Senate Minority Leader Janet Buley by two points in a Democrat year in 2018. Uh, he is running really strong. Uh, Keith Kern was just endorsed by the Democrat County Sheriff in Douglas County, uh, who is running against Nick Milroy, uh, kind of a, a backbencher in the legislature, doesn't really do very much. And then, of course, we have an excellent candidate, Kevin Hoyer, uh, on the La Crosse County Board, running in a very competitive region with a state Senate race and a state assembly race uh, against Steve Doyle. So I think we have a good chance to pick up those seats. Uh, in addition to that, we have other candidates uh, that I can talk about all day who are excellent folks uh, running all across the state. So I think we have a really good chance to retain our incumbents and do so in a way that also allows us to expand our majority. So what, before we go to you, Representative Pence, I mean, uh, Speaker Voss, I mean, assess the chances of getting your uh, veto proof majority. I think it's one third. You know, I don't think it's likely uh, only because of the environment that we are in. Uh, when you have literally two or three times the money that Republicans do, uh, Democrats have been trying to buy the election in this cycle in a way that uh, they did in last cycle when they spent more money against Governor Walker than he did himself. Uh, we now see all these supposed dark money groups that uh, good government folks only focus on on our side where of course people have a right to spend their own money in a way that influences politics, whether I like it or not, that's part of our constitution. Uh, Democrats derided that when it was against them, but now that it's on their side, they are absolutely deftly silent. So um, we're gonna probably be outspent, but we're not gonna be outworked. And that's why I think the legislature will come back uh, with a good strong majority for sure. And I think we have a decent shot, but, uh, but an uphill battle. Okay, Minority Leader Hintz, um, you know, given what you just heard there and what you, you've been thinking in terms of your strategy. Are you confident of holding off Republicans in their quest for a, a veto-proof majority? Sure, well, I, I just wanna start off briefly. You started off this question segment by saying it's a fraction of the 99 seats that are really up and uh, I would agree uh, that's intentional. And I think it's important to remember that this is the last cycle um, under these maps uh, heading into uh, the next round of redistricting. So. The fact that you know we're seeing changing districts and competitive levels despite these maps, I think, uh, is you know demonstrates I think the lack of support for a lot of the things that have occurred and the desire for change among um, people throughout Wisconsin, and that we're seeing the level of competition in a number of these seats. Um, this is my first full cycle, um, and one of our goals was obviously to look at the 2018 numbers. We didn't start planning things this summer. We November of 2018 sat down as a leadership team and said, uh, we want to prioritize quality candidates that fit the district and the ones that we know are most competitive. And again, I'll, I'll remind you, 
you know, in 2010, one of the worst years for Democrats in state history, um, under the last round of maps, we won 39 seats. And in 2018, one of the best years in Democratic history, we won 36 seats, which shows you the impact of, of redistricting. But there was a clear blueprint of which seats were going to be most competitive. Uh, in reaching out to people that would be good fits for the district. We found enthusiastic people who wanted to run, who just needed to know more about it, and uh, some self-selected people that have stepped up. Uh, people that really, you know, the best kind of candidate you can have is one that's following things and has said, uh, you know, I've had enough, I need to step up. Um, Chris Marion, who ran a very competitive race against Howard Markline in that Senate seat, is a great candidate that fits the district that we think is going to offer a contrast and expose Todd Novak as being really a, a rubber stamp in the 51st. Uh, Devon Draka, who's uh, been as engaged as anybody in her suburban community uh, against Jim Ott, offers a real contrast, a you know, great professional career, a mom, someone who's been involved in education um, that I think is going to be more in line with where those voters now. Um, but in some of the other races, especially this spring, uh, we saw healthcare professionals step up. Again, because of what the Republican response had been on COVID. Uh, I believe Representative Mako in the 88th had said it's survival of the fittest. And that's not exactly the message that I think voters and constituents in those districts want to hear when being reassured. Uh, so Kristen Lyerly, who's an OBGYN, um, is stepping up to run because she wants to see more science based, more healthcare based decision making because she knows that's the key uh, to the economy and to education. And Sarah Rodriguez and Rob Hutton's district. I mean, Rob Hutton spent all spring trying to get golf reopened as his number one priority when people were terrified and trying to deal with the impact on the economy. And then he said to the feds, don't send us any money, um, please. And then he uh, took a couple hundred thousand of PPP money for his own business. So that kind of hypocrisy, that kind of lack of leadership, I think has you know, motivated some folks to get involved in the race. And uh, Sarah Rodriguez is an epidemiologist uh, who's you know, worked in healthcare. And so we're seeing um, women step up that have been working in healthcare in these races um, and a number of other races around the state that, you know, again, um, you know, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, we're focusing on, but, um, you know, we got good candidates in those seats. And if it's a good year for Biden, we think the opportunity's there. And in terms of the incumbents, uh, we didn't just start focusing on those now either. Um, we sat down with them at the beginning of the session. We said, these are going to be competitive races. You're going to be targeted. But boy, I mean, Steve Doyle, Nick Milroy, Beth Myers, you know, Robin Vining, I mean, the first three who've been in office for a while have always overperformed the top of the ticket. Beth Myers, Steve Doyle had candidates uh, against them in 2018 and clearly overperformed um, their Republican opponent and, and the top of the ticket. Um, and Robin Vining hasn't stopped running uh, since she was first elected, um, you know, taking back Scott Walker's assembly seat. So she's as involved and as engaged with in the community as anybody else as a parent with two kids. Um, and um, I feel good about um, all those incumbents returning and I'm bullish on some of the opportunities that exist. Do you think you can come back with more seats? Um, I do. The opportunities there, obviously the, you know, the national political environment is, is, is volatile. Um, I don't try to make predictions in August and September, but if you said uh, a year ago, this is the position that you're going to be in, um, I uh, would say I'm happy with that. I mean, it's a little rich to hear the speaker talk about, you know, complain about, you know, money. Um, you know, the reality is that we're motivated. Um, there was, you know, uh, when, when I met with the party and I said, look, we need to protect the veto. We need to take advantage of opportunities. It's about the next decade in Wisconsin. Um, there was real motivation and there are individuals out there that care enough about Wisconsin and the direction of it to get involved, including former Republicans who have seen, you know, not just the direction of the country go, you know, backwards, but uh, really the direction of the state. So, you know, at a time when these guys are already having their dark money groups spend, uh, spend resources against our candidates, um, I don't think anybody's buying this like big boogeyman argument that, uh, you know, Democrats have all this dark money coming in. Uh, the reality is that we're motivated. Um, we're better prepared. Again, it's my first full cycle. Better candidates, better operation. Uh, now we just need to execute it and take advantage of opportunities. No, so, Jeff, this is the fifth time that you and I have had one of these preview discussions since I become speaker. And I, it feels like uh, Groundhog Day or Back to the Future because every time it was Peter Barker before, now it's Gordon Hinn saying, 
this is going to be the cycle. Republicans, you know, aren't as motivated as we are. We're going to take up, we're going to take seats and we're going to win back the majority. That was half the line that they said for most of the last decade. Uh, and I hear Gordon is again, uh, kind of singing the same song that we've heard four times before. I think it's going to be the exact same result in the end. Republicans are going to do really well because we've got good candidates. We know how to win. Uh, they do really good at the spin, but they just don't do great at the connection. So I was stay with you, Speaker Voss. Uh, yes, we have done many of these before, and uh, you, you you've been able to grow the majority. So, but w this year does seem to be a little bit different. I think you acknowledge the weakness in the suburbs. You know that that ring around Milwaukee isn't doesn't seem to be so certain this time, and and so uh, you know uh, I I think that you know you laid it out. There is some weakness there. Uh, explain that and explain your counter to again. This is a sort of a nationalized thing. It's about Trump, I think, right? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. I mean, let's remember that for the last decade, Democrats have tried to go back and win seats that had been theirs in the past. Uh, you go back and look uh, and see a lot of the rural or semi-rural seats that they used to be competitive in. They are no longer really even competitive. So the fact that we are fighting in the suburbs where we are still competitive, because you look at the bottom underlying numbers, those people by and large are still Republican. They might not vote for President Trump in every circumstance, but they still are, don't want higher taxes. They certainly don't want to defund law enforcement like people who are running literally in Milwaukee County have advocated for. They certainly don't believe that socialism or the idea that government should have more control in our lives is something that they want. Our polling shows that. I mean, Robin Vining's race is a good example. On the day after the primary, um, both the challenger Bonnie Lee and Robin Vining had similar name ID. In fact, our candidate was better known than Robin Vining, the incumbent, who supposedly had been running for two years. I don't know what she was running from, but she certainly wasn't doing a good job for her district because nobody even knew who the heck she was. She had passed no major legislation, had no major impact on anything that had to do with Milwaukee County or the district she represents in parts of Waukesha. So I think that's a prime example where Bonnie Lee is going to win that race. Uh, other races are, of course, challenging, but I have no doubt that Jim Ott, with a great track record of talking about drunk driving and issues that are definitely resonating in his district, along with Dan Canoodle and Rob Hutton as small business owners who have uh, helped to pass the COVID bill, helped to make sure that we have our economy reopening, those resonate in a district that still are going to be carried by and large by Republicans. Sounds like your number one pickup uh, that you're number one target is uh, Robin Binding in Wa Wauwatosa, right? I think she's our best opportunity only because it is uh, a traditionally Republican territory. Uh, we know that in Waukesha County, we have seen the numbers surge uh, for Republicans. I think they are going to way overperform where they did even four years ago for President Trump. So I know in my heart that that's our best opportunity because we have an incumbent who's done nothing and a challenger who has a really good record of service in the community and is working harder than almost anybody else in the state. So a representative Hintz, a minority leader Hintz, why don't you answer some of those things, uh, you know, uh, concentrating on vining perhaps before we go to audience questions. Well, um, I, you know, I'm just not buying it. I mean, that district has shifted uh, and the representatives and the candidates there uh, have not. I think Bonnie Lee, uh, boy, I'd like to see that poll because I'm just not buying it, but certainly on women's health and some other positions, she's got a pretty extreme position that I think is out of touch with the district. Um, and the fact that Robin Vining has taken the lead um, on uh, hazard pay and protective services for the frontline workers that we have out there. The fact that she was the co-sponsor of, uh, you know, redistricting reform, which has gone perhaps from an insider issue to the fact of everything that's wrong with our politics, um, you know, demonstrates that she's the one that's, uh, you know, stepping up and taking a lead on a lot of the issues that you're right, can't be signed into law until we uh, make some gains and change the faces. Um, but again, uh, you know, I'm confident with what she's built up over the last two years, as well as uh, the other incumbents that we have running, uh, not just because who they are, but as I mentioned earlier, um, because of the issues. I mean, when you are running negative campaigns on, you know, socialism and uh, the sort of boogeyman taxes, I'm sure immigration's just around the corner or uh, distorting, you know, defunding police. I mean, those aren't the state issues that we've been dealing with. I mean, that is a distraction, a fear mongering, a reinforcement of Governor or President Trump's, you know, kind of devices, uh, divisive rhetoric. It's really about trying to motivate as many uh, right wing extremists to turning out. And, and that's just not Robin Vining's district. I mean, that's a suburban district with affluent voters who have changed their minds about what they're looking for. Um, 
you know, I don't think Rob Hutton and Jim Ott have changed their positions at all, even though their districts uh, have. I mean, they were drawn into safe districts. They didn't have to do a whole lot. Our polls show, um, you know, that some of the candidates, Dan Canodal, Rob Hutton, they're not very well known because I don't think they did a whole lot for eight years. Uh, and now that they've got to hustle a little bit, um, you know, people are saying, well, wait a second, you've been around, but I've never seen you out. I've ne you've never been out there doing anything. Um, you know, they, you know it's, it's too late. And, and Jim Ott, I mean, for a guy that was, you know, certainly on the news and has high name ID, um, you know, it's not a good time to be, um, you know, against pre-existing condition coverage or anti-science or anti-climate change when we're having a real referendum on that at the national level and, and one that I think Democrats have the advantage on. I mean, Gordon, do you want to call out some of your own members? I mean, David Bowen, Jonathan Brostoff, a bunch of folks have been part of the protests against the police. They have taken a pledge to say that they are going to defund the police. Why don't you right here, right now, say that those members are wrong and that we should not spend less on our police than we do today? Well, those two can speak for themselves. The reality is trying to link individual members or people to sort of the worst actions of individuals that have been involved. I'll go back to my, you know, is, is I don't think, you know, uh, the right way to go about it. The reality is that I'll go back to my previous statement. Um, it's an understandable position to uh, support the men and women that work in law enforcement and still want to hold them to high standards of accountability and make sure uh, that the training and practices and tactics in, involved uh, treat people fairly. And so those two are definitely passionate about an issue that's important to both them personally and to the people that they represent. Um, you know, and obviously, uh, I, you know, I think the issue has been distorted as have some of the actions, but, you know, you guys continue to try to throw that around and tape it on to um, other candidates out there. Um, I don't ask anybody to sit there and, um, you know, why did Gordon Hintz, you know, wear shorts today or something? I just don't think that's, uh, you know, how this works. Well, let me be totally clear, Jeff. I do not support defunding the police. I will fight any effort in the legislature to reduce spending on police. Uh, Gordon cannot say those words because his base will never allow it. So it's just a shame. But no, I, I, mean, look, I don't support defunding the police. I talk to my police chief pretty regularly. I talk to my sheriff, you know, sent the same message. Um, you know, I think the discussion has a more productive title about the best way to go about ensuring that we're in protecting everybody's public safety uh, and giving them, you know, the resource priorities and uh, to be able to effectively do their job. Well, I think it was only a matter of time before I lost control of this discussion. So thank you both of you for, uh, you know, that's okay to jump in. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's okay, uh, you know, but it's, it's a little harder when we're, when we're Zooming. All right, I'm going to go to some audience questions now. Um, you know, this one always comes up in, in uh, this uh, session every two years. Uh, what's the sleeper race, uh, Representative Hintz? What's the, what's the one that when, uh, when we do know that what the results are, uh, uh, that'll be the surprise? Well, I mean, there are a number of them, but I, you know, um, I clearly uh, the uh, the candidate up in the 75th district with the KKK mentioned the timing, you know, couldn't be worse. I mean, we saw demonstrations around the state of people expressing themselves because they felt that what happened in the George Floyd murder uh, was out of line with their values. And that included in rural communities. And I just don't think people want a uh, representative who espouses those types of values uh, representing their community in Madison. Um, and we've got a uh, former Wisconsin Badger, John Ellison up there, who I think is a far more clear, credible uh, individual that uh, you know, you're gonna see uh, maybe what we saw in 2012 uh, with then Representative Rivard having sort of a misstep that uh, was pretty consequential in terms of turning the outcome of that election. So. Um, you know, the numbers there have been mixed. It's a district that we used to hold with Mary Hubler, but it's certainly an opportunity and it would be un not unreasonable to expect Joe Biden uh, to, uh, to do well there. I would say in the outer suburbs of Milwaukee, we've seen jumps, but when you have districts drawn the way they are, you know, a district jumps from high 30s to mid 40s. The question is, will there be coattails if Joe Biden's able to get over 50 with some candidates that perhaps under-resourced in an area that's not used to voting for a Democrat? Um, you know, I don't know how much Ken Skronsky is doing out there, nice guy, but can't imagine him doing a ton of doors. Um, we've got a good contrast in that race. Uh, Mayor of South Milwaukee, you know, Eric Brooks uh, running against Jesse Rodriguez. I think that is a, you know, seat where you've got a three-term elected mayor who was ran unopposed in, uh, 
in April. Um, you know, and he's someone who's doing a ton of doors and he's a great fit for the district. So, you know, we'll see, but, um, you know, sales up for Democrats in the assembly and uh, we're making sure that those candidates are going to be able to take advantage of the opportunity if it's there. Okay, uh, Speaker Voss, I guess you can answer some of those uh, uh, targets that uh, that uh, Representative Hintz mentioned, and you can talk about what your sleeper race is. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, with Dave Armstrong, I mean, let's just start out with the assumption that Gordon and I have each done things where you look back and you're that like that might not have been the smartest thing to do, right? So um, does everybody watch every single video all the way to conclusion before you hit retweet, before you share it on Facebook? No. It's a prime example where Dave Armstrong probably should have watched the entire video before he decided to share something years ago. He didn't, and he's already said that was a mistake. So I think in that district, people know him. He's a long time community leader, been elected multiple times, uh, heads the economic development agency really well liked. He's going to win that race, uh, even with the smear tactics of the Democrats. Uh, in southeastern Wisconsin, uh, Jesse Rodriguez, also very well connected. She has already completed all of the doors in South Milwaukee, and she has moved on. Uh, we'll have all the doors in her district completed before the end. She is super hardworking and very well liked. Our polling shows that she is clearly ahead, so I think she'll be fine. Um, in the suburbs of Milwaukee, Ken Skaronsky just won a uh, primary. He is working hard. I think these are all pipe dreams on the part of the Democrats. Uh, if somebody wins with 60% or 57%, it might make you feel a little bit better, but just like in football, all that matters is who wins the game, not how close it was. Uh, so I think that's where we're going to have a good, strong majority. We've got so many seats right now that we are working on. Um, I don't want to point out one or two. We've already talked about the four. Uh, that I think we have the best chance on the numbers, but we have excellent candidates in every seat from the inner city of Milwaukee to the Fox Valley, all the way through uh, all of Wisconsin, where I think we are going to dramatically overperform what we've done before. And I think there are races that Democrats don't even see coming uh, that we are going to have a good chance at. But a lot of this depends, uh, Speaker Voss, uh, on uh, President Trump uh, making this, that, that it's closer than the polls are showing now, certainly, right? Yeah, I mean, let's remember when Barack Obama won in 2012, um, we know that, actually, let's go back to 2008. Uh, he won in 2008, I think it was 54-46 under the previous maps, uh, and Republicans still held 52 seats at the end of that night. So even when we had a wide berth without as many incumbents on the ballot, uh, we still saw at pretty much that was uh, more or less the record for a Democrat in our state in modern times. So even if it is that way, I think we'll still come back with 60 plus seats uh, because the Democrat vote is so hyper concentrated in Madison, Milwaukee, and a few of our urban areas. It's just not spread out in the way that Republicans are, which is why we have a much better opportunity to pick up seats because we have rural areas we're fighting in uh, versus Democrats with this hyper concentration of their vote. Okay, I'm gonna stay with Speaker Voss. This is another audience question, and I think it's mostly directed at Republican leadership. So uh, will there be a, uh extraordinary session this fall before the election uh, with the legislature. You folks sent a lot of bills over to the Senate uh, and there are, I guess, 100, about 100 bills passed by the assembly and they've just been parked there for months. Do you want to have yeah, well, an extraordinary session before uh, November? Well, when you have your Senate counterpart or Senate counterparts on, you should definitely talk to them because you're right. We do have over 100 bills that were sent over, uh, everything dealing with PBM reform to water quality, all kinds of good things uh, that are awaiting Senate action. Uh, I know there is a chance they might come back after the election, but uh, the thing that I hope most people look at is that when we're in the middle of a political cycle, having folks uh, spend time trying to mix politics and policy isn't always the best. So I prefer for us to do our homework, make sure that we are ready to come back. Uh, we have our speakers task force, which I think is off to a really good start. We've had over a hundred people apply uh, to be part of our speakers task force. We'll make those recommendations sometime probably next week. So I think we're moving along at a deliberate pace, but at the same time, uh, Governor Evers, when he put out his requests, he's had no conversations with the Republican leadership. It's not been sincere in any way, shape or form. Uh, and that's why we did ours a different way. We actually ask Democrats to participate. We have a Democrat co-chair. So we wanna find something that can actually have bipartisan support, not just the way Governor Evers does it, which is to you know, kind of telephone from the basement uh, what he wants to do without ever actually talking to anybody. Uh, that is the big weakness of the way that he leads uh, or doesn't lead, frankly. So to me, I think that it's uh, premature for us to have any kind of a special session until we've gone through the difficult process of listening, 
learning and making sure that we have recommendations that everybody can support, hopefully when we come back in January. Okay, Minority Leader Hintz, what, uh, what would you like to do in terms of the assembly or the legislature coming back before the election? You know, look, um, and I think the speaker and I agreed with this, uh, you know, when we worked together on some of the COVID package that we needed to do. Um, sometimes there are things that you need to do because uh, there's some immediacy and some urgency. Uh, and, and some of it is also in this toxic political environment that we can demonstrate to the public that we're capable of governing and leading, which sometimes does not seem apparent, especially in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I, I wish that we had met earlier um, on some of the reforms that the governor proposed in his special session um, on uh, both racial disparities and, uh, you know, use of force reform. Um, I think there were some things there that didn't require the long and deliberative process that we could have um, accomplished. And I, I still hold that out there. Um, I think it's harder on things like the coronavirus only because of resources. Um, even though we're in better shape than we thought, uh, the federal government has a bigger role. I'm hopeful that they will pass something soon that will give the state the idea of what we can ultimately manage. But um, you know, I'm a believer. I, 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 I note the fact that you don't want to be making decisions right before the election in this political atmosphere, but I do think that our campaign cycle and our legislative inactivity is, is too long, um, especially when there's some things that are unaddressed that we should get at. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Senate will act uh, sooner than later on some of the good bills that were passed uh, by the Assembly. Um, but I also think there's some urgency to demonstrate that things are priorities, um, you know, to, to the government officials that certainly are with the public. Um, and that can maybe set the tone for what more will come in the full legislative session next year. Okay, let's say here's another audience question. We have about eight minutes left, so probably time for a couple more. This one, I think uh, it's your turn, uh, Representative Henson. It's about the unemployment insurance and the backlog. And, um, you know, I, I, there's some questions here about the frustration of those who are still, uh, I've gotten a couple about, you know, we need this money now. So what, what about that, the backlog? I mean, when it comes time to when there is a legislative session, what can be done to make the system, get rid of the backlog, make the system work better? Well, clearly, um, the first one is updating the infrastructure that we know at least initially was one of the biggest cause for delays uh, that had been recommended, I think, going back to 2014 in terms of the updated system technology that would allow us to process claims quicker, um, earlier, uh, perhaps not individually. Um, but, you know, the reality is over the last decade, we have seen obstacles put into place for people getting their unemployment. And those are things that we had to fix this spring to even be eligible for um, some of the federal funding that's out there. Uh, the reality is every state in the country has been impacted when the bottom comes out on the economy, when people start going out in public, when they stop going to stores, when they stop going out to eat. And so it's been devastating to see what the impact has been um, on workers uh, around the country and state. Um, but I agree. I mean, the reality is the response has been too slow. Uh, for people that ultimately need it the most and that in many cases are still waiting. Uh, certainly the demand, you know, exceeds the av available staffing and resources, although those, those have been increased. And I know all of our offices continue to try to check in so we can at least give some certainty. I think we should review and revise, um, given that we are probably looking at uh, the coronavirus uh, impacting segments of the economy, some more than others, uh, for, for a prolonged period. Um, but the reality is, if you're going to have the floor come out um, on, you know, an economy as quickly as this, uh, we need to be able to, um, you know, have the resources as quickly as possible, have the technology to make sure that it's done. Um, and when we look back, try to figure out what the obstacles were. Uh, the reality is some of the other impediments and requirements that have done by the federal level require uh, state DBWD processors to do each case individually to verify things. It's the kind of thing that would have been nice if some of those things were waived and we could go back and check those if someone was wrongfully pursuing unemployment. But it's been, it's been hard, um, to be honest with you. These are the toughest conversations. This is a lot of the work that legislators do when they talk to constituents, when they listen, when they hear from them when they want to go to bat. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you that it's, it's the thing we hear about the most. Uh, it's been challenging. And if there are things that we can do, 
um, right now. And we've certainly pushed, and I think some changes have been made, but heading into the next budget uh, to make sure that, you know, should this continue or happen again, that we'll have a better response. So, Speaker Voss, what would you do to fix the UI system when the next time you, the legislature does meet? Uh, well, first of all, we did a lot. I mean, to Gordon's credit, he and I worked pretty well together in the spring uh, to actually put together a COVID bill, which dealt with some of these issues, not taking care of every issue, but we did give ultimate flexibility for the administration to transfer as many folks as they could to deal with the uh, backlog. I mean, this was happening in March and April. We knew there was a problem. Uh, one of the things that's really disappointing is that they could literally transfer a thousand employees over there uh, to be able to figure out some of these cases and work on these issues, and it just hasn't happened. Uh, they hired a call center and it took them months to get that done. Uh, we now have people who literally applied in March and April and are not having an answer as we get toward Halloween. That is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and frankly, if it were Governor Walker, we would have seen front page editorials about the ineptitude of the department. But again, because it's Tony Evers uh, working from the basement of the mansion, we really don't see much coverage on this anymore after we tried to make a big deal of it this summer. And we are continuing to try to raise this issue. If somebody has been unemployed and they are going months and months without any income whatsoever, it is a travesty that Tony Evers is not putting his uh, shoulder to the grindstone to figure a way to get this done. And it's just not happening. Um, and the crazy thing is that for all the folks who are attempting to get unemployment, uh, we still know that if you talk to employers in almost every part of the state, even though we have almost 10% unemployment, there are help wanted ads, there are jobs that go unfilled all across the state. So there is a mishmash between folks who are unemployed, trying to get their benefits, trying to figure out whether or not they even qualify and their ability to go out and seek employment in one of the times when we know employers are desperate to find people who are able to work. So, uh, you know, when they criticize Republicans for not upgrading the infrastructure, Governor Evers didn't even ask for that in his budget. So this is not something where, you know, either side saw this coming or took it seriously. Uh, I think we need to do a better job than we did before. Uh, I still support a lot of those reforms so that people can't commit fraud. The idea is you're supposed to be on unemployment in the short term as you go out and look for other employment. Uh, not kind of having it be a way of life because of the huge increase in the federal reimbursement for unemployment for folks. So um, I think most people want to go to work. The vast majority want to get their benefits and get back uh, to be able to support their family, but they've had this bureaucracy inside government that has made it really challenging. So we are going to keep trying to raise the issue. We hope Tony Evers and his administration will finally listen and do something about the literally tens of thousands of people who are waiting for an answer and feel like they just can't get one. Okay, we're down to two minutes or about a minute 30, and I'm going to ask this question. It was on my list, and I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. So given all that's going on with mail-in balloting uh, and uh, in-person absentee and uh, how many polling places will be open uh, for in-person voting uh, on Election Day, do you have confidence in how the election system is working uh, and that it's going to work well uh, for the November election? Speaker Voss. Yeah, we made the right decision to have the election in April. That was a good uh, effort. We did a great job in the primary. And here we are getting ready for November. I, I assume that somewhere between 40 and 50% of people will cast a ballot before election day. They might do it through the mail. They might do it in person early voting. Uh, or then we're going to probably have 50 plus percent of people who still go out on election day. So I think all of those scenarios, we have done the very best we can to make sure that they are safe. We have a system in place where you have to show a photo ID. No thanks to the Democrats. We have a system in place where you have to have a witness so nobody can take your ballot and just say you're Jeff Mayers uh, without actually ever having to show that he really existed or wanted to cast his ballot that way. That's the witness requirement. We have a limit on the number of days that you can do early voting so it can be done safely. Uh, you have to do it in a polling place where you have a clerk doing an observation so we know that a person is showing their photo ID. And then of course on election day, uh, we're gonna make sure that it's done safely but also done in a way just like we did in April where there is really no problem for the public to be able to cast their ballot and do it in a way that allows them to have many options. So I think we're gonna have record turnout. Uh, I know both sides are very motivated to turn their uh, voters out. I think that's a good thing for our democracy and hopefully by the end, uh, we'll be able to showcase that this is an election to remember, but also one that we can be proud of the way it was administered. 
Okay, Representative Hintz, the Minority Leader, you have the last word on this, and then we'll uh, be uh, closing down the session. So go ahead, Representative Well, Hintz. I'm also confident that Democrats are going to turn out. They demonstrated no matter what obstacles, uh, no matter what unsafe practices, no matter how many hours they had to wait in line, that they were willing to turn out, and they delivered um, to get Justice Karofsky added to the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. And I think they'll find a way to get it done, no matter how many obstacles, you know, Donald Trump dismantling and casting doubt uh, from the US Postal Service, um, folks that are gonna get their ballot and drop it off in a drop box. Um, it hopefully uh, will avoid uh, a decision to kind of mess with the ballots. Um, the state Supreme Court ruled, but I understand the federal court may also rule related to the Green Party. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, Democrats are going to make sure that they get to the polls, no matter what obstacles these guys throw in front of them, no matter what past or future disenfranchisement attempts uh, come out there, no matter which Russian bots are ultimately involved. Um, but I know our clerks are also prepared. Um, we have more than 1,800 clerks throughout the state um, that since the April election have been planning for this high turnout election, uh, have put things in place, um, have put protective measures in place if we are going to have in-person voting. But obviously, we're seeing a record number of people um, request absentee ballots who will vote, who will vote early, who will ensure that those get in. Um, and, you know, uh, those that don't will try to get to in-person absentee or to get there on time. But no matter what, what's in the way, um, I've never seen a determination like this. Uh, to make the changes necessary and as dysfunctional as it can be, we still have a democracy and, and that's how we make a change. Okay, well that uh, brings us to the end of the discussion, went a little over time, but we had a lot of important uh, things to talk about. Really want to thank Speaker Voss and Minority Leader Hintz for doing this. It keeps up a, a nice tradition I think we have and then after the election we'll welcome uh, one of you back as the uh, uh, for a conversation with the Speaker and the agenda of the Assembly. So uh, good luck to both of you in your races and everybody remember how to vote. Uh, remember to, to explore your options and to vote. So I want to thank uh, again our sponsors for this and uh, future programs in Madison. Uh, Hush Blackwell, American Family Insurance, the Wisconsin Hospital Association, ARP Wisconsin, XL Energy, and Walmart. And please tune in next week uh, for our two sessions, uh, the Pat Lucy book on Tuesday and the generational differences between uh, female voters on Wednesday. Thank you very much. And this is Jeff Mayer signing off for today. We'll see you next time.